SLA Video Productions presents Live from the Eileen Humphrey Auditorium in the beautiful Westlake Community Services Center in Westlake, Ohio It's Westlake Live! With a passion for history and the women responsible for it, Women in History steps out of the pages of books with dramatic recreations of the lives of notable women. In celebration of Women's History Month, today, SLA Video Productions host Addie Krinko will be chatting with Women in History's president, Linda Witkowski, who will share the origin of this great organization. Please give a warm welcome to Addie and Linda. Thank you, Joanne. I'm really excited to be part of this today because I have witnessed over half a dozen presentations by women in history, and as a result, I'm a huge fan. So that being said, um, Linda, how did you get involved with women in history, and would you give us a background on the organization? Sure, Addie, happy to do that. And um, good morning to everyone here, and good morning to everyone that may be joining us online. Um, and yes, Women in History was begun in 1991, so you do the math, I'm not good at it. And it was started by a woman named Sophie Dadas, who was based in Lakewood, Ohio. And initially we did get generous support from the Lakewood Public Library. And her goal, her vision was to bring women's stories out to the world with the belief that th those stories are really not adequately told in the textbooks. Uh, so we're here to fill a gap, actually. Now, as for myself, um, in 2003, which was the bicentennial of Ohio statehood, uh, the organization decided to create a new program to honor that. And they created what we called the First Ladies Tea. And that involved having First ladies from Ohio, Ohio being the, you know, the state of presidents. Uh, so we had a number of first ladies. And so we had someone occupy or studying each one of those. And then the first ladies tea would bring together maybe two, three of them. And they would chat and they would tell their stories at that time. So I came on as Ida McKinley at that point in time to sort of fill that slot. That's wonderful. So over the years, how many women have actually been portrayed? And can you give us some more examples of who would have been uh, presented? Gosh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I can't name them because there are about 70 of them currently. I can probably rattle off a few of them. Uh, we've had a few more, a few less over time, but that's about where we are now. The membership itself consists of 14 people, and all but one of those people are also presenters. And that one is very important to us because she is our treasurer, mm. and she keeps us on the straight and narrow in that regard. But the rest of them, myself, the other board members, uh, we present just as well mm -hmm. as the other duties that we, we have for the organization. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, each one of us has got multiple characters that we do. It kind of develops over time. The top being our star performer, Sherry Tolliver, who has about 26 characters that she portrays. And would you be able to tell us some of the people she has uh, presented? Certainly, yeah. She, uh, she does um, Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. and we have any number of, we, we've, got a, we've got Harriet Tubman, we've got Sojourner Truth, we have got Abigail Adams can come to your garden party if you would like Abigail Adams to come to your garden party. So we're really happy to be able to, to provide that service. Uh, it, and it is, um, it's becoming increasingly important now because there's so much focus on whether there are filters on stories, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's textbooks or media or anything of that nature with us, we do all of the research, and these women's stories are unfiltered, whatever they may be. So we're going to bring everybody, um, really, the, the true history of all of these women. Well, that's great to hear. So let's ask you, who has not been done that you would like to have seen done, or who might be in the works right now for a future presentation? Yeah, uh, we have a couple coming up. I am so excited about it. Within the next six months, 
We hope to be ready with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Fabulous. And Sally Ride would oh, be good. another one. Mm -hmm. And I think, fingers crossed, someone that we are, we are talking with that may be able to bring Sacagawea uh, oh. to our stable of ladies. So Okay, so um, it looks like, are these women strictly out of the history books? Or do you go to other sectors of life, like entertainment, oh, yeah. the arts, sports? Absolutely. And any place that women are making notable contributions, you know, we bring them forward and we highlight them. And the entertainment industry, I mean, you know, we've got Gossip Mavens, um, you know, Luella Parsons and Hedda Hopper. Okay. Um, and so we have Mae West, so mm -hmm. out of the entertainment field, definitely out of, out of the STEM field, and we're hoping to augment that. Um, one of our characters is Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, who was a, a pioneer in the computing industry uh, and a long-term, longest-serving member of the United States Navy. So we really draw from all, all walks of life, not just the history books, not just entertainment, uh, sports. We need to pull from sports. So we're looking for anyone who wants to bring, you know, um, a Steffi Graf or someone uh, to us. Okay, that's good. Um, are these only American women that you showcase, or do you go beyond our borders? As of now, we have been all American women until just recently. Uh, we have taken a look now and said, well, perhaps we can begin to introduce some of these women's stories, you know, from beyond our shores. And we have got one that is uh, available at the moment. Um, so we're hoping maybe to expand this as, as we go forward. And that's Florence Nightingale, okay. because she has also had a quite an influence uh, on the United States. Mm -hmm. She influenced Clara Barton mm -hmm. during the Civil War. So she's got ties enough here as well. Well, that's good. Um, in doing the extensive research, because when I've witnessed these presentations, it's the breadth of knowledge <laughs> that is presented is, is pretty impressive. Um, what have you found out that maybe surprised you about a particular individual, whether it's something about their personal life or maybe even an activity they were involved with that was beyond what they're known for? Yeah, really so many. There are just so many. And I mentioned Florence Nightingale before. And if you consider the time, you know, the, in, in which she lived, uh, she was very good at mathematics. She ended up being a statistician, something people don't really know about her. But she was challenged in her struggle to try to be allowed to study mathematics. She was at that point in time not allowed. She had to get her father's permission to study math. And she finally wore him down and got that permission. But it was with the proviso that a minister be there in the room while she was learning mathematics. Oh boy. It escapes me why that was important at that point in time, but it was. Okay, well, um, coming along with the surprise theme, I understand that we have a special guest that's going to be joining us today. But before she's introduced, um, we would like to reach out and let you know about sponsorship opportunities that can connect your service or business to these informative podcasts. So before we bring out our special guest, here's some words from SLA Video Productions. You can make a difference. Show that you care about the community. Be part of the conversation. Bring generations together. We can showcase your services or business to your target audience. Using the latest technology. Sponsorship opportunities are available on multiple platforms to get your message heard. Let us help you tell your story. SLA Video Productions. Creating quality content. Who is going to be joining us today? Oh, I am so happy and I am so proud to be able to bring you Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. If we can welcome her, please. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. I can only stay for just a very few moments. Thank you so much. Hello and hello and hello. It's very good to be here. 
I can only stay for a very few moments because I am only on my way through Westlake, Ohio, on my way to New York, and so I can only speak with you for a few short moments, but I'm so very happy to be here, and I could not come through Ohio without stopping to see my dear friend Linda. I continue to be active um, on the lecture circuit and, and uh, writing books and still have some input in the United Nations, so I continue to be quite busy still sometimes even teaching. And I know that my children have told me that perhaps it is time to slow down. Franklin has been gone for many years now. But what I've learned over the years is that once you stop making a contribution, once you stop being of service, that is certainly when you begin to die. And so I will always, always be busy trying to make a difference in this world. You know, I've been first lady and I've been called the first lady of the world. I believe that John F. Kennedy has just nominated me for the Nobel Peace Prize, and I've been called a great humanitarian, all kinds of wonderful accolades. And I tend to take all of those compliments and honors in stride, because I've also been called some things that are not quite so complimentary. I've been called ugly and homely. I've been called a communist. I've been called a pervert. I've been called a loudmouth and a troublemaker. And so that helps me keep my ego certainly in check. My own mother, who was very beautiful and a socialite, told me as a young child, Eleanor, you will never be attractive, so you might as well learn good manners. I had a difficult and lonely childhood. I lost both my mother and my father by the time I was 10 years old. I was sent to live with a grandmother who was very strict, very harsh, and would not allow laughter or toys in her home. And she called me the ugly duckling of the family. I didn't go to school because I had a tutor come in to, in to teach me and to educate me. And that tu tutor was rather sadistic when I think back on it. So as a small child and as a young girl, I was really afraid of everything. I was afraid of, of the dark because my grandmother would send me into that room and close the door when I would be crying. I was afraid of animals, I was afraid of water, I was afraid, I was afraid of other children because I had never had the opportunity to play with any of them. And mostly, I believe I was afraid that no one would ever truly care about me. But there was one person in my life who changed everything for me. When I was about 15 or 16 years old, finally my grandmother thought that I should go to a real school. And she sent me as far away as she possibly could. She sent me to a school in England called Allenswood. And there was a woman. I, I believe that many people walk in and out of your life. But it is a true friend who will leave a footprint on your heart. And the teacher at that school, Madame Suvestra, left her footprint on mine. Even though I was homely and shy and awkward, and everyone had always made fun of the way that I look and the way that I speak and the way that I dress. Madame Suvestri saw in me a purity of heart and a nobility of spirit. And she told me, Eleanor, there is no one who can make you feel inferior without your consent. I can see that you have had an unhappy life. But happiness in itself cannot be a goal. Happiness only comes as a byproduct, and it only comes by serving others and making a difference in someone else's life. Madame Sylvester took me under her wing and traveled with me all over Europe, showing me the importance of social causes and people in need in, in countries and communities all over, the, all over the world. There was a wonderful tradition at Allenswood when you would do something kind for one of your other classmates, they would acknowledge that gesture by leaving a flower in your dormitory room. There were so many times when I came home from my classes at Ellenswood and I would open the door to my dormitory room and the room would be filled with flowers. Those were perhaps the happiest days of my life and I still have Madame Suvestra's portrait next to my bedside. When I left the school, and when I met and married my husband, Franklin, 
and became a wife and a mother, I still always remember the importance of what Madame Souvestre had taught me, to always be of service. My mother-in-law, Sarah, had taken over all the household duties and raising my children, basically, so I, I had to find other ways that I could be of service. And shortly after World War I, I became active in, in the consumer league. Working conditions were terrible for workers all over this country. Children were employed in factories. I became an advocate for women and, and joined the League of Women Voters so that if women had the vote, they would be able to use that vote wisely. I became a teacher again. I, I started my own school and tried to pattern it after Madame Souvestre. I worked for women and I worked for minorities. Many Negroes in this country didn't share any of the same rights that, that we privileged people took for granted. When Franklin was stricken with polio, I had to even go out more to keep that Roosevelt name alive. And I was terrified. But I always felt it was important to do what you think you cannot do. I was so incredibly busy with so many different organizations and causes that when Franklin was running for president in 1932, I did not want to be a first lady. What did a first lady do besides stand at the side of her husband and try to look attractive, which I was never very good at? And I was sure that I would be, be unhappy because I had to give up all the causes that, that I was so passionate about. But there was a woman who worked for the AP. She was a reporter by the name of Lorena Hickok, who took me aside and said, Mrs. Roosevelt, we all know that you do not really want to be the first lady. But consider this. If you are the first lady, you can become a first lady unlike one that this country has ever seen. You can become a voice for the oppressed. So when Franklin was elected, that is exactly what I tried to do. I tried to make certain that the New Deal was a fair deal for all Americans, not just white men. During those years, we made great strides in civil rights and so it was introduced social security, helping the poor and the homeless, creating safety for, for the youth and so that children were allowed to be in school, not working jobs in factories. When we were met again with the Great War, World War II, it was time for Franklin to retire, but he could not because the country needed him so. So we were basically on the home front. I went and visited troops all over the world because he was unable to travel. And I worked tirelessly for refugees that were left homeless and shattered after that war. When Franklin passed, I said, my story is over. There is nothing left for me to do because I'm no longer the first lady. Then President Truman said at Franklin's funeral, Mrs. Roosevelt, I'm so sorry for your loss. What can we do for you? And I thought once again about Madame Souvestre, and I said, no, not what you can do for me, but what can I do for you? What can I do for this country? President Truman put me on Committee 3 of the United Nations. I think he thought I would not be able to cause any trouble there, it was health, education, and welfare. But on that committee, I think I was able to finally create what I am most proud of, and that is the drafting and the ratifying of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that it is not only Americans who are entitled to natural rights and life, liberty, and, and, and happiness, but every single person who lives on this earth is entitled to those same rights. And in a country such as ours, with such great resources, it is our responsibility to make sure that those rights apply to everyone. And that is where I'm headed now. I'm heading back to the United Nations to, to give some more speeches uh, on that declaration. And so I cannot stay with you for very long, but I, I will be back in this area on Tuesday if you want to speak with me a little bit more, I will be coming through here again, I think, at, at the library in Fairview. And I'd be very, very happy to see any of you there. 
Thank you so much for inviting me to stop in. It always is a great pleasure. And right now I just have to say, always do what you think you cannot do and never turn your back on life. Life was meant to be lived at any age. Thank you. Thank you. brought her story to us today. Well, so now you understand in the flesh what Women in History is about and why I'm a big fan of this organization. That was just outstanding. Okay, so with that in mind, what do you find gratifying about being part of this organization? <sighs> So much, so much. It's a process of sort of being seduced into the value of what we do, really. I'm seeing it now with some of our younger members that have joined. Uh, and, and it begins as, OK, I can do this. We will learn this. We will present this. Um, but then they begin to see the responses from, from the audiences to the stories as they're telling them. And one of our newest members actually had been uh, presenting Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, and in the audience was someone who had met Dr. King. Oh. That made our performers day totally and it made her experience. So there's, there's no end of these really that happen. Okay, well, expounding on that, um, why do you feel women in history is important, what, what you do? It is important work that we do because women's stories are just not told in the way they should be told, or as broadly as they should be told. Uh, I did sort of an informal uh, survey amongst some friends of mine that are educators and asked, okay, what do the textbooks cover about the women's suffrage movement? And the answer is very, very little. Um, people know two names, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and it sort of ends there. Mm -hmm. and, and for instance, the, the, the events at Seneca Falls in 1848 uh, that really began the movement for women's suffrage that went on for years and years, and still is going mm -hmm. on actually, these are unknown events. And uh, I think that they need to be brought forward. And we're in a position to do that. And we're proud and happy to do that. Yes, you do it very well. Um, so something just came into my mind. And now it has escaped me. Give me a moment. Oh, OK, yes. She's just one member of your cast. Right. Well, how many people do you have right now that do perform? Well, as I said, it is, it is 14 people. Oh, 14. OK, excuse 14 me. 14 people. All right, yeah. And each one has multiple characters. Our mm -hmm. newest members start out with one. You know, mm -hmm. We go easy on them. Mm -hmm. And then over time, you know, they might add others beyond that. So we account for the 70 some odd um, women that are represented. If you go to our website, we have them all listed out there so you can find out who we do present for. Okay, and as far as how they get involved, do you recruit people? Do they come to you? Is it a two-way street? And if somebody wanted to book one of these women for an event, you know, upcoming, I know I threw a lot at you. That's so, okay. Uh, but yeah, how would somebody get involved if they were interested? Well, the answer is kind of all of the above. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we, we do reach out. We're particularly reaching out to increase the diversity of our organization, and I'm very proud to say we're making great strides in that direction. Uh, and sometimes people will come to us. They might find us by attending one of our presentations mm -hmm. or by the, um, by the website. Okay. So there's a lot of avenues that you can contact us with. Okay, well, those I'm going to give you some information if you're interested. Um, their womeninhistoryohio.com is their website. That's correct, and you need the Ohio on there. Otherwise, you go down some strange roads. So okay. Womeninhistoryohio.com. Okay. Um, a phone number, 216-228-4779. The email is very similar, but the email begins with women at women in history ohio.com so um yeah correct if you find our website you, there's links to our facebook you'll find the phone numbers you find the email addresses so everything that you need okay well this is the conclusion of our discussion what we would like to do now is invite members of the audience to pose questions to linda you can let Cheryl know you're interested if you have a question. Otherwise, if you're viewing this live stream, 
There is a chat box where you can insert a question and it will be retrieved over here and posed to Linda as well. So who would like to go first? You can also ask Eleanor any question you might like. I <laughs> yeah. see her lurking there. Yeah. Okay. So I think she finished her speech. So do we have any questions for Linda or Eleanor? Hi, Paul. Hi. I taught social studies for over 30 years. I've seen about six of these presentations. Mm -hmm. I learned more there yes. than I ever taught yes. Yes. because yes. A, a, a name is the only thing that came out. The story behind the person never came out in my class. Mm -hmm. So I thank this organization for what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you for that affirmation very yeah, much. Yeah. I, I think we would all agree, and another thing that I personally noticed, because I've seen multiple, is that history repeats itself. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, okay, we have Marianne, wait, wait, wait. Is there plans that this organization will branch out to other areas, or just Lakewood area? Oh, we will go anywhere, and we, we are really, we've got a strong presence in Northeast Ohio at this point in time. But we go anywhere. I mean, we've had members travel out to Texas, you know, if they contact us, and we can work through the travel arrangements. Uh, we've had people present at the Library of Congress, so, uh, wow. yeah, and, and recently, I'm not sure why, we are, we are big in libraries in Illinois. So they found us, and we are happy through our virtual presentations to be able to participate with them. So we can either virtually or in person. Okay. Well, any other questions that either on the... Oh, okay. okay. Cheryl. This might sound a little off the wall, but have you considered doing Jane Fonda? I recently did a, 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 a little essay on who was a hero to me, and she just came up so big. I don't know that we have anyone thinking about her right now, but we can certainly you know, add her to the list. She's kind of a controversial figure in a lot of ways, and she, her name was well known during a very pivotal point in our history. So um, we'll put that on the list, thank you. Well, may I ask a question kind of in relation to hers? Um, are most of these women that are portrayed, are they deceased at this point or are some of them still living? They are all deceased. Okay. That is our one requirement. And that is... Um, okay. So, so that we're not... Not we're not dealing with people. I mean, so many have asked, you know, when we might do Michelle Obama, for instance, and there's so many that, of course, we would love to. Um, but we can't just by the, the sort of the rules of our organization right now. Okay, that makes sense. Um, may I ask a question of Eleanor? Where do you get your costumes or your, your, your wardrobe, your hats? <laughs> well, she's got to bring herself down yes. here. Yes. I have to bring myself down. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yes, the hat is just absolutely yes. luscious. Um, the dressing up is half the fun for us, yes. I believe. <laughs> um, and, and we go through multiple different sources to find our things. So, I mean, there are some wonderful vintage clothing stores in Cleveland, Ohio, and that's where I picked up this dress. I couldn't stop at one. I probably have three. And um, Chelsea's on West 116th Street has a whole like ceiling full of all kinds of wonderful hats and such. Um, sometimes we find things that are really, truly vintage. Um, I portray a Civil War spy, and I have an outfit that is actually from the 1860s. And it's just threadbare, but it's just such a miracle to put that piece of clothing on and know that somebody wore this in the 1800s. And I can't breathe too deeply because it shreds, and it also smells very bad. <laughs> but, uh, but then sometimes, we, sometimes, too, we have people create outfits for us. There, there are sometimes seamstresses, or there are some places online who recreate, who make reproductions of, of historical costumes. So sometimes we go that route. And a lot of times we just exchange and pass around to each other as our roles and as our sizes change. Um, but it, it is great fun, and to be able to be this age and have this kind of ability to dress up and <laughs> pretend to be someone else is just a joyful thing. And then to tell an important story is also such a joyful privilege. So uh, thank you for having us both here and today. It is fun. Calamity Jane, however, we sort of went to goodwill. I mean, I don't need to go much beyond that. <laughs> um, do you ever have to go to a dialect coach or to help you with maybe the accent, or do you just listen to tapes or just kind Eleanor of... Eleanor was easy to listen to tapes, yeah. and so yeah. I did listen to a lot of 
videos with her voice and try to copy without it becoming too, you know, over exaggerated. To copy a little bit of her speech patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, I, I do a, um, a Civil War spy, um, as I talked about, who wears the outfit, who's from Richmond, Virginia. So I have, like, Googled um, YouTubes of people speaking from Virginia to try to capture a little bit of the Southern dialect. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we never want that to become distracting. Yes. But uh, we've never had a vocal coach because if it's that challenging, we'd probably just say never mind. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Mm -hmm. and, and YouTube is your friend. I mean, you can find uh, instruction on just about anything. Right. So, yeah. right. right. How long does it take you to actually do all that research and read <laughs> your act together? Do you want me to answer that, Linda? Months. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Months. Months or even years. 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 It, it kind of depends. I mean, mm -hmm. I really... Uh, if six months is probably the lowest. Yeah, and, it. and it's constantly changing. Um, I came on as Eleanor Roosevelt 25 years ago because Eleanor Roosevelt, the, the one before me in women in history, moved away to another state. And so I came on because I saw an ad in the Plain Dealer or the Cleveland Press that they needed new people. I auditioned as Eleanor. And by far, out of my 12 characters, it's, it's my absolute favorite one to do. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. What did you, oh, preparing. So yeah, um, research things online. The internet is a wonderful source. And inevitably, when doing something like Eleanor, there are people in the audience who either met her or have a, a memory of Eleanor or, that, or that, that Roosevelt administration. And they'll raise their hand and say, did you know Eleanor also you know, helped the nurses during the war? And do you know Eleanor I, you know, used to drive a roadster? And I saw her peeling out of the White House driveway one time with, a, with the top down. And, and, and so they come up sometime with wonderful little anecdotes. And, and that's a real treasure, too. So it's a constantly evolving story. Um, it's always changing. And, and sometimes articles will come out in the newspaper, um, revelations about you know, uh, one of the characters' personal lives or in a different decade their contribution is viewed a little bit differently. So we're constantly changing, and you would never see, I don't think you ever see the exact same show twice. No, I know Eleanor is never the and same. evolving, I think, is really the key point. I mean, mm -hmm. you do your initial research. For myself, with Ida McKinley, I was very fortunate because I live near Canton, Ohio, mm -hmm. um, and, and her house is there, the First Ladies Museum, a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, organization. There is the house where Ida McKinley grew up. Uh, but since then, there has been a couple of additional books uh, that have been written about her, mm -hmm. including one about <laughs> the murder of her brother, which was something that is a very little-known event in, in poor Ida's life there. Yeah, he, she was, he was shot by a jilted lady friend. So um, you do find more interesting things mm -hmm. as time goes on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions, or are we... We good. Okay, well, I guess that wraps up our presentation today of Women in History. Um, from everyone at SLA Video Productions, thank you for attending. And just a reminder, again, womeninhistoryohio.com is where you can get more information. And especially if you want to book someone like Eleanor or another person, I mean, now you see what they're capable of doing. <laughs> So we hope you'll um, stay in touch with them. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Addie. Have a great day. And we want to hear from you. Contact us online or through social media with ideas and suggestions for future content. Also, you can help us enlighten and inspire others by sponsoring one of our video podcasts or any of our content.